Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Day Zero Podcast. I'm Spectre with me is Z. Today, we have a variety of topics, including an SNI proxy buffer overflow, a follow-up to the Masticore exploit chain for console stuff, and more. As usual, though, Spot the Bond comes first, and I'll let Z cover the solution for that. And this week's Spot the Vuln was uh, based on a code pattern I have seen a handful of times. Uh, what we've got here, operational set, uh, type def for a packet, fairly simple packet, opcode and data. Opcode is a short, data is a character pointer. Uh, from there, I have a type def for a handler function type, uh, which just takes in a packet and returns nothing. So. Presumably, each opcode would have a handler, which is what comes next. Handler, uh, an array of those handler pointers. Um, ends with a null, kind of as the key trigger point there, although in this code, nothing's really scanning for that. Uh, there's a define there, ops count, or uh, that is a typo, should be ops count. Uh, this define should match the uh, name of the label used down here. Uh, so if anybody was confused by that, my apologies, but uh, you have ops count. I said to 100, you can just assume it's going to be however many entries are actually in the handlers. Um, and then finally, you get to the dispatcher, which takes the op code, uh, use the modulo or percent operator, and just runs out with the op count. So you've got dispatch. It's taking an attacker controlled packet, reads the op code out of it does a modulo to kind of get the appropriate index. And if you go too far, it just translates your index into a value that is still within the appropriate range and passes the packet along. I've seen that code pattern and that idea quite a bit in the sense, or that idea, at least the concept here being correcting user input. Rather than throwing an error, trying to recover, fix it, and keep going, which just generally is a bad idea. I think it's usually going to be a better idea to just throw an error and let the user or whatever correct it rather than trying to magically continue, especially with something like this. If somebody gave an opcode that's out of range, odds are you don't want to wrap. But I have seen that ex our people do that exact sort of thing. In this case, the problem ends up being um, because the opcode can be a negative value that's a short value, uh, so it's signed, that can go negative. And then with the modulo op operator, um, it will return a negative value, so you'll actually end up with a negative offset into the handler's array. Uh, so you'll end up accessing before, or you'll end up trying to call into a function or using a function pointer that exists before the actual handler array. What, what an attacker could actually get there in practice is going to vary, and you're kind of limited in this case by the ops count. So if you have a very small value, uh, you're very limited in terms of how far back you can go but you are getting that out of bounds access from it. Okay, sorry, I think you cut out for me, so I didn't know when you stopped talking exactly. Um, but yeah, um, so we'll move into our first topic here, which is a Talos report on uh, SNI proxy. And uh, yeah, so it's straightforward buffer overflow in the SNI proxy reverse proxy that can be triggered from a wildcard configuration, uh, which you know is a fairly standard functionality to offer. You can configure host names to be a wildcard for the back end. And uh, sort of where the problem begins is the fact that HTTP host headers as well as TLS headers, um, there's no length limitation. So you can provide a host name that's as long as you want. Uh, and later on, they showcase this function um, new address, which will, you know, try to copy that host name. Um, problem is for that copy, they use the source length, which is attacker controlled. So they can just exceed the size of that destination buffer being 262 bytes and just get a classic stack overflow. Um, so, you know, kind of a meme issue, uh, again, as per usual with these types of stack overflows, uh, and you know, where it's software that I don't really use, I don't know if it has stack canaries. I'm assuming it probably does. Um, if it does, and it's going to be a bit trickier to exploit this, uh, if it doesn't though, it would probably be fa fairly straightforward. It, I mean, you would hope something being network attached is going to have canaries, but this is just an open source project that, you know, people for people bring it into their own code base. I don't think they have like the actual pre-compiled like library or something. Uh, so it's going there, to depend so... on how it's being built by whoever's using it as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's going to depend along there. And I do want to clarify a point. 
Um, the uh, source length that Spectre mentioned here, uh, that comes from the length between the start and end square bracket. So this vulnerability ha seems to happen when uh, parsing an IPv6. So you have like the square brackets around the IPv6 digits. Um, and that's where the vulnerability comes in. I was actually a little bit confused on this one by uh, exactly why it tied in with the wildcard host, because it seems like it's just parsing, like as they call it out here, they're, they have that IP buffer that they're parsing, looking for the first character, last character. Doesn't seem specific to a wildcard host to me. I, like It seems like there's a little bit of context missing in terms of how this is actually being... Or I guess how they named it. I mean, the vulnerability seems clear. Parsing either the host header or SNI, if it contains the IPv6, it drops into this to parse that out into the IP buffer or into the stack buffer. So perhaps that's only reach if you're using wildcard and otherwise like uses a like a exact comparison between the strings. Maybe something like that, like it only parses it for that, maybe, but... That's how I interpreted um, it, is that it's this parsing code is only reached when there's a wildcard hostname. Yeah, um, and that's definitely possible. It, I It didn't seem like they really called that out. I'll still include the uh, patch here for this. You can kind of see exactly how this gets introduced, or like how you could cause this. Just sending in a host, even without the IPv6 characters using an actual host in there. Works just fine to trigger that parsing. Uh, but yeah, the, the fix here was just length check, as you would expect. It's a pretty, pretty simple issue, but here I pulled the patch since we did have it, or at least one instance of it. This is one fork of it that has the patch, or has a patch. Yeah, and of course, an issue like this is something to be aware of, especially where it seems like there are so many forks of this project. Um it's pretty unlikely, I think, that this vulnerability is going to uh, flow nicely, you know, downstream to all the forks and whatnot. So um, if you're using something that is using SNI proxy, might be worth checking out. Uh, but yeah, like you said, where it's network attached, you would kind of hope that it's mitigated. But uh, we don't really have that context because Talos doesn't really dive into the exploitation angle or, or anything like that. Um, it's just kind of their disclosed reports that are meant for the vendor. So uh yeah, we can only speculate a little bit on that. Yeah, it's a bit limited there. and I don't know. I was just trying to pull off the forks, but I don't know. This particular instance doesn't look like it's also getting forked too much, but I'm not sure what the source instance was for SNI proxy. This is the first one that popped up uh, when I did a search for it, but I didn't try and dig too far into it since it had the patch, which is what I wanted. Yeah. All right, so Seaturk uh, put out a follow-up blog post to Masticore, which is the PS2 emulator exploit chain that targets PS4 and PS5. Um, we covered a few emulator bugs in the exploit chain written by Macaulay before, uh, which targeted the application process and achieved code execution via ROP. Uh, I forgot to write down what episode we covered that on, so I don't know if Z can maybe look that up while I'm talking here. Um, but yeah, that was targeting the application process. However, there is also the compiler process, uh, which is a little bit more interesting because it has JIT access. Um, for those that don't know, uh, Sony tries to limit what processes can access JIT on uh, PS4 and PS5 to mitigate, you know, being able to get very easy code execution. Um, so they only grant it to a few processes, and this compiler process has to have it uh, for JITting the PS2 emulator. Um, so if you can, you know, compromise that compiler process, you could get native code execution, which is a lot nicer for um, getting things like a limited form of homebrew, and it's just nicer to work with from an exploit perspective perspective as well. So the application process has to be able to talk to the compiler process to do that just stuff. Uh, and the IPC mechanism they use for that is primarily shared memory uh, with a socket used for signaling. Of course, where shared memory is involved, time of check, time of use type race bugs are a really good starting point, uh, of which CTERT noticed a few. For example, there's this bit of code he goes into uh, where they'll do like a, a loop using a variable in shared memory for the loop condition. It'll You can just keep It'll just keep reading it, so you can you know swap that out and do some interesting things. Um, but ultimately, the vulnerabilities that were detailed here were even more simple than that. So the first vulnerability, which was spotted by the flow, um, was the compiler process places pointers to its own memory space inside of the shared memory region. Um, so yeah, by just reading out 
those pointers, uh, you kind of get an instant info leak and ASLR defeat for the compiler process. He did try smashing these pointers to see if you could trigger some interesting behavior. Seems they're not actually used, and so there weren't any, you know, corruption logic uh, that was useful. But it's still a useful find for that ASLR break. Which is um, odd, and just though, kind of a fun have them in there but not use unless they're kind of in there accidentally um in the sense of like an initialized data leading to them being put in there or something it, it does feel a little bit weird though that the pointers would be present but i i guess in other things if they're used earlier in the process or like um in like some obscure path yeah it could be they're used earlier my other guess would be that it was from like code an earlier iteration of code that used to do stuff with it and doesn't anymore. And they just kind of uh, stuck around there, but yeah, it's, it's hard to say, but it's, it seems they're not really used. So they needed another vulnerability for the corruption part of it. Um, and there's actually two more. So vol number two was an out of bounds, right? In this tentatively labeled manually inject function. It's not fully clear what this function does though. It's not really relevant beyond the fact that it'll read this controlled index from shared memory and use it to index into the shared memory region to write an instruction mapping. Of course, that index isn't bounds checked, and you can simply get an, a relative out of bounds right here. Um, and at first glance, it seems like a pretty powerful one, as I believe you also have some control over the value that's written, uh, because it's derived from the requested PS2 address, which I think also comes from shared memory. Though the stride of where you can write out of bounds is a little bit weird, um, because it's at hex C byte intervals, which isn't page aligned. Um, so in that way, it's actually a bit weaker than the next vulnerability, um, which was another out of bounds write, much of the same cause. Um, this time in the write relative jump function for generating relative jump instructions, it'll again use an index from shared memory and use it to write these fixed values of hex E9 or hex EB. Um, despite the value limitation, like I said earlier, this one is a little bit more favorable for exploitation just because it's at hex 10 byte intervals uh, and thus page aligned and can be a bit more reliable. Um, so, you know, CTERD highlights that one as, as the more interesting one. Uh, getting a bit into exploitation, despite the trivial nature of the bones, it is a bit tricky where ASLR is involved um, because the mapping that you can hit is lar largely going to depend on, you know, where things are mapped at runtime. Um, the data segment while you know where it is, unfortunately, it can't be targeted because it's mapped too low in the address space. Uh, and the range you can get out of bounds right on on both vulnerabilities is going to be on the upper end of the address space. Uh, so like the heap is a potentially viable target. But where that is relative to shared memory is going to vary depending on, uh, you know, the run. Um, thankfully, though, that instruction mapping cache that was involved with uh, one of the earlier vulnerabilities that I touched on, uh, is actually huge. Like that mapping is like 68 megabytes in the heap, uh, which is a pretty large portion of the address space. And so because of that, it can be brute forced fairly easily. Uh, you're left with, uh, you know, 1,024 possible offsets. Um, so it's not super unreasonable uh, to be able to exploit that. Um, unfortunately, Suture notes he didn't actually end up finishing the exploit, but it does seem reasonably doable. I don't think he didn't finish it because it's not possible or it's, uh, you know, not exploitable. Uh, I think it's just, you know, other things took priority and I never got back to finishing it. Uh, he seems pretty confident that it could be could be fully exploited. Um, so what's the uh, recovery process on this? So let's say you're trying to brute force that. Um, are you going to end up with a crash? Like, I... Um, what, what I'm wondering is one, if you'll end up with a crash and how long it takes to act, if you were to actually try and brute force that, how long it would take. It's like a thousand twenty four possibilities. Isn't that bad if you're not going to crash? Yeah. So I think it kind of depends and partially on how you write the exploit, because if you're able to write out of bounds and then side channel that somehow, or get like an Oracle, um, like you're probably going to be writing into mapped memory, so you're probably not going to seg fault immediately. Uh, if you can determine like where you're writing before you write a bunch of data, um, or you can just you know keep like, I think it's somewhat likely that you won't crash basically, um, even if you're not writing exactly where you want to, um, just because of you know how much memory is mapped, especially with that like 68 megabyte mapping. I think you said that's like 60 percent of the heap or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so like a fair amount of the address space is mapped. Um, so I think it's fairly unlikely you would crash. That said, in the event that you do, I'm not sure what the recovery looks like. Um, I'm not sure if this is one of those processes that would just get re restarted by like a uh, watchdog daemon. 
Uh, I, I think it's likely given that it's like a compiler process like that. Um, but if it does end up crashing the whole application, then yeah, that would be quite an annoying recovery process. Um, yeah. Cause I mean the getting it down to a thousand point four is definitely a night. Uh, sorry. Um, Uh, it's a nice uh, number to be down to. <laughs> That's a lot better than brute forcing the whole address space. But I don't know. Sometimes you, you can be bit by, you know, nice looking numbers, but still doesn't work out in practice. But yeah, I guess it does depend a lot on, I guess, other aspects of the X Y that he didn't explore in this post. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm not too familiar with like the PS2 emulator and these processes are, that are involved, so I can't go into all the nuances. Um, but, you know, given that C-Turt has looked in, into it and uh, has spent a lot of time here and seems confident it's doable, I, I you know, I trust his word on that. It's probably not too, too unreliable to be able to hit uh, that instruction mapping. So, yeah. Um, now, as you mentioned before, with his first Massacore post, Patching this is pretty difficult, as the PS2 emulation stuff is so decentralized and multiple games could ship these bugs. Um, so instead, what Sony ended up doing was they tried to mitigate the impact of getting JIT execution somewhat. Um, and they did that by limiting the amount of allocatable JIT memory that's budgeted to the process. So on, yeah, on 6.00, they only allow you to allocate 65 megs of, uh, of JIT memory. Um, for an exploit, this is huge. This really doesn't do anything. I'm guessing their main concern here is piracy and trying to limit the ability to just like toss games in there and execute them. Um, though Seater he thinks that even that might be breakable uh, and could be gotten around by, you know, dy dynamically paging things in and out as needed uh, or using other clever tricks like that or maybe doing like a, a weird machine um, using gadgets, you know, in between mappings or whatever. Y you can do some creative things. Um, this is a little a bit of a weird mitigation though um because it, yeah i i the only thing it could really be targeting is piracy like you you don't even need a tenth of 65 megs for uh you know exploit scratch space or whatever i mean um, can you imagine what you could do with that much shell code <laughs> yeah I, i'm so, just imagining you know that car made me fit so much shell code <laughs> in this baby yeah that's that's a good one yeah um somebody should make that but yeah i mean I think it has to be on the piracy angle. Um, I think you would mostly like, I guess they're mostly worried about pirating other PS2 games, but yeah, I'm not sure. It's a little weird uh, and it seems pretty flimsy too. I think is like workarounds seem likely to uh, hold water. So yeah, it's kind of an interesting fix in quotations. Um, it's just kind of an unfortunate position for Sony um, that they put themselves into, I guess with the PS2 emulator. So it's, yeah, this is pretty cool research, and it's going to be somewhat timeless for PS4 and PS5 research. Unfortunately, uh, one of the biggest things with Mastercore and why I haven't looked into it too much and don't really use it is you have to be able to do save resigning. Um, so in order to exploit it on the PS5, for example, uh, or, or even PS4, like you need a, a jailbreakable PS4 to be able to do uh, you know, that, that save resigning. Uh, and the other thing is you need to be able to obtain a copy of these games, which means you need to be able to update to do that. Um, so it, it's a little bit circumstantial on whether or not you'll be able to use this if you're trying to do research. Um, but if you are in a position to use it, it's it's pretty cool um, because, yeah, like I said, it's it's not really something Sony can mitigate. And native code execution is quite nice, especially in a PS5 environment where you have, uh, you know, exo text and dropping is somewhat mitigated there. So. Yeah, uh, some really cool research, um, fairly straightforward bugs, n nothing too complicated. It's just, you know, there's there's attacker controlled shared memory uh, for IPC and they they just seem to trust it implicitly in certain places. They just don't even check what's coming from it. So, you know, uh, leads yeah. to some pretty silly bugs. Yeah. Uh, speaking about the mitigation, I, I think we talked about this back when uh, uh, like Mass Score first dropped, but it does feel like a really weird decision to me uh, that Sony made in terms of how they kind of decentralized the emulator. Like, they wouldn't have wanted that to just be a package that could be updated on the system and instead having it, like, shipped with each game individually. I know we've had that discussion. There's probably just the fact that 
some of the games they probably do update or like change the emulator to work for their game to have better performance and all of that as they port it to there. So like there's the reason for it, but I mean, yeah, it just it created this kind of giant door that I mean, maybe you have some challenges getting to it, but it's still a pretty big attack surface that once broken, it's kind of perma broken. Um, exactly. And also kind of at the top of this topic. You mentioned that we've covered kind of Master Core stuff before. Uh, that was episode uh, 188 and 190 were the two most recent times we covered uh, something Master Core bugs. Yeah, because that was part two and part three, I believe, uh, from Macaulay's yes. uh, posts. So, yeah. yeah, exactly that. Yeah, and I think All we right. covered uh, when Sea Turd first dropped Master Core also. I feel like we might have covered something from him also. I think we um, might have given a shout out to it at the time, um, but I, I don't remember. Maybe it, it would yeah, have been a little while I, ago at this point. I wasn't able to find what episode that was on, so maybe it was just a shout out. Uh, but at least the most, the two most recent times were one eighty eight and one ninety. Yeah. So yeah, there's no public exploit implementation for this at the moment. That said, you could. Um, you know, the pieces are out there to put it together um, with Macaulay's research and and the information from here. It's it's doable if you're, you know, in a position to to try it and go through it. So, yeah, it uh, could be a fun project for anyone that's interested in like a break in project for breaking into console console hacking. It's probably a good good starting place. All right, so uh, getting into a much more serious uh, exploit chain, uh, Google Project Zero put out a uh, O'Day in the Wild uh, RCA or root cause analysis. Uh, this time on uh, Samsung Xenos based Android devices with NPU. Um, so this this chain affects uh, you know Samsung Xenos devices uh, prior to the January 2022 security patch, uh, and at the time prior to September 2021. NPU was reachable from untrusted as well, so it, it could be quite a valuable exploit chain depending on you know which device you're targeting. So yeah, Z, I'll let you get into this one. Yeah, and for kind of being reachable from an untrusted application on Android, uh, feels like a kind of silly issue. Um, it's a double free, which we also haven't covered too many double frees. We get like the use after free. Um, Quite a bit, but less often with double free. Uh, so anyway, what we've got here uh, is ignoring a lot of the details about how uh, the MPU actually works. You've got the device, the Vertex 10 device. Make your IOPTO calls on it. Um, one of those calls is the... Or, well, ultimately leads... It's this uh, v VS4L Vertex IOCAS format. Uh, you can call that IOCTAL. It eventually leads its way down into this uh, VBQS format function. Basically, what's going on is if you make that IOCTAL call, you're able to provide a format list. That's just like your color spaces that it, you're indicating what format, whatever it's doing is going to use. Um, if you provide it an invalid format, so a list that it doesn't know, when it gets down to this search here, so you can see it's iterating over F list count. I should mention the format list is just a count and an array. It's this array that gets double freed. Um, so fairly simple structure, but it went, gets down in that IOCTAL call, makes this search and goes looking like, hey, find this format you sent in. That format goes into the function, looks for it. If it's an invalid one, it's going to return a null. I mean, like, hey, I can't find this. So format or if not format drops down and just frees all the formats out and returns an invalid. So from there, you've got that freed. You can then trigger basically the whole cleanup routine through the uh, VS4L Vertex IOC stream off IOCTL, which, as you might guess, stream off. It's doing a lot of cleanup. It eventually leads into this NPU queue stop. So it goes through all these queues that it has and stopping them. Leads into eventually also the BBQ stop. Um, and inside of VBQ stop, um, it just ends up calling K free on exactly the same thing. Um, so effectively, these two Y octals call the first one with something invalid, it frees it, then go to clean up, it frees it again, you get your double free. 
From there, you kind of have that primitive where you're able to get that reused elsewhere with different structures, and you can have the same memory. So because this address is going to be in the free list twice, you can have that get reallocated twice by different mappings and kind of have two different areas of code using the same piece of memory. And you can kind of go for more of an exploit from there. Talking about the vulnerability, though, like the main thing that catches my eye is kind of twofold. One is the fact that it does the free without uh, giving it a null value, uh, which is actually what they recommend and how they patch it is nulling it after they free, but just changing it to some sort of trigger value so it's clear that this is not valid anymore. So you can't have a dangling pointer, or in this case, a double free. Uh, the lack of that, and then the fact that kind of execution just, it gives you the return, but it doesn't like clean up anything else after that free. So if you were to see it go and like do more of a cleanup, that's maybe less of a trigger warning of like something could be going on here or something vulnerable could be going on. But when you don't see it uh, changing the value and it kind of resumes execution as normal, I mean, it does give this return value, but doesn't do a ton of cleanup there. Those two things kind of would be an indicator to me if I were looking or if I were auditing the code for this as like something might be might be able to reuse that value again. Um, but yeah, just uh, they recommend towards the bottom here, just uh, set the pointer to uh, null after free is how do you kill this bug class? And that's basically what it is. Um it is fairly simple to avoid it if you do just remember to free or sorry just remember to null after free um i did find it a little bit interesting that they mentioned that this they thought that this could be or could have been found uh just by doing variant analysis of a previous report uh, the cv 2020 uh it could have just modified the poc for that um taking a look at it uh, the proof of concept here, at a glance, looks like a um, looks relatively yeah, relatively different bug. But apparently, like the way they describe it here is that the proof of concept from this could also be used to reach it. So I don't know. I didn't dig too much into this because um, I think this just well, I just saw this today. Um, I'm not sure when. When they actually publish this post, they just have the disclosure date, but that's the bug disclosure. Yeah, I think it was a few days ago. I want to say it was like maybe Friday or Saturday, but... Okay, I just didn't see it then over the weekend. Uh, either way, uh, main, po I, main point is I just didn't get to dig into that as much as I would have liked. But yeah, the bug did seem a little bit different, so I'm interested in what the connection is there, or if there is a deeper connection. Although it does just make it sound like it's just like generally kind of rough and bad code. Uh, Cause they even mentioned that like looking at this, they found other very similar issues. I think they mentioned finding like three other variants of it just from this one. Yeah. I think the, the way that I read it, um, cause I, I noticed the same thing. Like I was thinking like this other bug they're mentioning isn't really even the same bug class. Um, cause that was like a talk to in like shared memory. Uh, I, I, my thinking on it is that it's just like the POC, they took it and, you know, if you fuzz from there, just did a few modifications, you would have hit this bug. So, um, maybe just like saying that bug tipped the attackers off to that attack surface, um, is kind of what I was reading it as. Cause yeah, like the, the bug doesn't seem super related, but, um, what you're saying about it being weaker, weaker code. I mean, yeah, we've covered Samsung NPU uh, a few times on the podcast before. Uh, okay. It seems to be one of the weaker kernel drivers on Samsung devices. Um, I, I did want to clarify something, too, because a lot of the code, they use, like, the VB, uh, very, like, you know, acronym. Um, there was a joke made in chat by APR, you know, like VB.net. But uh, for those that aren't familiar with it, it, it stands for Vertex Buffer. Um the NPU, which is the neural processing unit, it's going to be doing a lot of things with, you know, processing images and stuff. Um, so I believe what it's what it's doing there is processing tries or triangles. And, you know, the vertexes are being parsed into the vertex buffers to do 
all of that uh, parsing. So that's that's kind of what's going on here. It's a little bit of a weirder area where it's doing like, uh, you know, image stuff, um, which is part of why I guess it's so buggy too. Um, is because there's a lot of parsing of untrusted data and a lot of uh, complexity into the interface as well. So yeah, uh, and the fact that it was accessible to untrusted at one point, it, it's a, yeah, it's a golden attack surface. Um, that fact yeah. actually is a little bit surprising that they would have just opened the device up to be available to uh, untrusted app from the get-go. Because it, it is seems just generally really a new device. Yeah, it seems really lazy, um, especially when you consider how much work Samsung tries to put into you know, securing attack surface and mitigating what you can do post exploitation with things like Knox um, seems like kind of just a gaping hole that was left in there. I, I don't know if it's just because it was different teams and, uh, you know, one didn't care about it, the security as much as others. I don't know. Um, the other thing I thought, too, was like, you know, of course, this is very straightforward and easy as far as Android bugs go. Like, this is probably the easiest Android one I've seen in a while. Um, but the other thing is, it's pretty rare to see exploits taking advantage of freeze and error paths like this, um, because typically like the usual code pattern is you would allocate using a local pointer. And then once all the initialization was done, then you would set the, uh, you know, shared, shared buffer, shared object pointer um, to it. You know, like you would, you would make sure everything is done before you would share that pointer to other things um but here they just like inline allocate straight into the the queue um with that allocation which is like just such a bad idea <laughs> in kernel code uh because there's a lot of like things that can go wrong when you do that um especially when you're factoring in things like concurrency and whatnot so yeah it's it's a bit of a weird pattern to see it's rare you see these error patterns that are causing uafs um that are accessible in that way but you know, in this case, it, it did. So it was kind of a funny, funny thing to see. And, you know, yeah, and that, fun to see a, where you don't see it like ever at, at this point. Yeah, no, and that's a good show just regarding the kind of normal architecture. I was talking earlier about noticing kind of the dangling pointer, but you know, that is another good show in terms of something you can kind of keep an eye out for. You know, when you have familiar with code bases, knowing how is this normally done and then being able to tell when somebody's, you know, Going a little bit off the beaten path in terms of how they uh, implement something. Yeah. Um, so it seems like this attack surface maybe isn't as interesting anymore. Um, I'm not sure exactly which domain they've privileged off this device to, actually. I I, th I think it was mentioned before when we covered NPU last time. I just I can't think of it right now. I'm kind of blanking on it. Um, but I want to say it's like system app or something. So it's it's not nearly as. Uh, uh, you know, interesting in terms of getting immediate escalation, but yeah, uh, it seems to be a fairly weak area of code and, or at least it was, um, cause this bug is a little bit old, right? This, this bug was from like 2021, uh, patched early 2022. So it, it's a bit late getting, uh, you know, posted about, I guess, uh, which is interesting too, because, you know, this is the, in the wild series. I don't know if maybe, uh, it's been found in the wild, just patch gapping, uh, just a lot of Samsung's on older firmwares because, you know, like I've, I, I kind of go into this rant every time I talk about Samsung, either on or off the podcast. Um, but their, their update system really sucks. Um, especially if you do any like modification and you're not like a vanilla Android user. Uh, if you do like any customization to the operating system, like flash it or disable secure boot or whatever, um, they, they don't, they don't want you to do over the air updates. So like straight up block it. So, you know, things like that do open Samsung devices a bit more to patch gap type attacks. I think though, in but, fairness, most people aren't doing that. No. Um, like, but you are a uh, very much a power user if you're going that route. Uh, but the date timelines interesting, actually. Um, I do see kind of this as being, reported there September 25th, 2021, and then patched on the 1st of January. Um, so yeah, getting it in the wild now does feel a little bit weird. Although I guess they do call out this is the first patched version. So yeah, perhaps there was like the patch gap that you were talking about. I'm just yeah. trying to scan this, see if they 
make any other mention of it, but I don't see anything. Something interesting, by the way, that I didn't really notice before. I'm just kind of reading it now. Um, the section on the exploit strategy, they talk a little bit about how the sample uh, abused this. Um, mainly the fact that Sorry. Uh, yeah, they would they would use a pipe buffer for like the uh, the UAF object um, for getting like a read write primitive, and they'd use a kernel space mirroring attack, which I think we've we've touched on briefly before as well. Um, but yeah, it's a little bit interesting how deep they go on the exploit strategy. I don't remember if they've really done that a ton on the other ones. Uh, they were they were able to go into a good amount of detail here. Um, but yeah, like double free, uh, it's a pretty powerful attack vector and it's going to be really hard to have that not be exploitable um because it, it basically gives you a targeted uaf right um in yeah like in whatever terms zone of, you can get it in in terms of the power of vulnerabilities like i tend to look at double free use after free and type confusion it's all is kind of like the same same core primitive where you have code parsing the same memory multiple different ways type confusion you have no control it's just it's getting confused over the type, so you have the normal code and you have whatever it's making the confusion with. You don't really have control. Use after free. That second allocation of it, you control the type. Well, you probably have some control over it. And double free being the most powerful where you kind of control both ends, both the, well, in the, or in the use after free idea, you control both like the user and the after free user, but... That doesn't really hold for a double free, but like you control both sides of it. Yeah. Uh, and IAPR mentioned even regular updates suck if you're not using your flagship devices. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of stuff about Samsung I really don't like about what they do in the Android ecosystem. I won't go into it too much here. You know, maybe that could be like a bonus rant video or something one day. But uh, yeah, uh, they're, the way they block off and gatekeep their um update process is a big problem in my in my view both for you know people that just want feature updates and for security uh it kind of sucks in every way so i mean that's yeah. an issue but their whole knock system is in itself an attack surface that we've seen some pretty crazy bugs out of when it's supposed to be a security feature like i i genuinely think they would be more secure using main like using the mainline code rather than yeah. trying to be special although they do get the benefit of being unique and that then means like exploits have to be targeted to them there's an argument to be made on that i can admit i don't agree with it but there is an argument there yeah and that's kind of the other thing as demonstrated by these npu bugs is uh a lot of the public exploits that have been seen targeting samsung devices are targeting samsung's code um, because it's just kind of a weak link in the chain, whether it be NPU or Knox or some other custom driver they're rolling or customizations of regular mainline drivers that they make for no reason. Um, that's true it, on like Huawei and everything else, though, too. All of the custom well, Samsung's drivers the worst defender, are. Though. Samsung's the worst defender for it, um, because a lot of the other devices will kind of play with the, like, uh, play nicely with the ecosystem and just kind of share code. Um, you know, anything that's custom to them, they will, imp you know, is obviously a, a target. But like Samsung will go out of their way to modify code that they don't even own. Uh, like things that other devices are using from the mainline, they'll just customize it. Um, it doesn't really offer anything. Like their their changes aren't, you know, performance improvements or feature improvements. They're just, they like to edit things. So yeah, that's, you know, it comes back to bite Samsung and NPU has kind of been a problem before. Uh, so it wouldn't be surprising if we see it come up again. Um, yeah, but, but yeah, like, in this there case, is... the vulnerability was was pretty straightforward. Yeah, there is no like mainline NPU driver. Like it is custom to them because it has to be. Yeah, NPU, but... to be fair, is their own thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's like my issue is when they do start modifying core and stuff. That's where they tend to also introduce bugs because... I mean, you just get less eyes on it, like very simply that that's generally the case. And that's true with all the random drivers from other manufacturers, too. But I don't know, because Samsung, I think, goes so deep with their changes, it just kind of creates those extra problems. But I think that is a discussion for another day. 
Well, I, I do want to add a quick thing. Go for it. Like, to be fair, in Samsung's, uh, you know, to Samsung a little bit. Um, Exynos is their uh, device, like their chipset. So Samsung is in a bit of a unique position in the mobile space, too, because they're also a chip fab. Um, so, like, a fair number of, an- like, other Android devices use Samsung's chips. Um, like, for example, Google's newer SoC that they're using in the Pixel phones is based, at least in part, on the Exynos devices. I think they're starting to branch out a little bit more. Um, but because Samsung is both a phone vendor and also a chip manufacturer, that's also why they have some more of these custom components like NPU. Um because, yeah, like they control the chipset that is their custom technology. So, you know, to be fair to them, that's also partially why they're a little bit uh, notable in terms of having custom code in the in the Android ecosystem. Um, so, yeah, I mean, where I spent so long kind of ranting about them, I, I figured I'd throw that in there because that is a, a point that should be considered, I guess. Um, although it seems like Xenos is being kind of phased out. I think I mentioned this the last time we talked about them uh, a couple episodes ago, but uh, it seems like Samsung themselves are even starting to move more towards Qualcomm-based devices. Um, I don't know if it's because they've just kind of given up on Qual- uh, sorry, on Xenos. Um, I don't know. It's kind of interesting. We'll have to see going forward. It's kind of hard to say right now, but um, yeah, like I said, Samsung's kind of in a unique position and because of that, they get kind of these unique bugs. So, yeah, and uh, you know, I've heard them all mentioning back in my day. For some reason, I imagine you know me turning into an old man. Uh, yeah, uh, sometimes I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I'm starting to become a little bit more jaded than I used to be. So, uh, I'm not gonna refute that. So yeah, uh, that's pretty much all the hard topics that we have. We do have a shout out, which I'll let Z get into, and then we'll wrap up the show. Yeah, I've just got this one shout out here from uh, the GitHub blog. Uh, code to, code QL zero to hero part one. Uh, despite the name uh, with code QL, they talk a little bit about code QL, but what they really get into is like more of the implementation details about building like the static analysis. Um, and I mean, they the subtitle here is the fundamentals of static analysis for vulnerability research. I thought there were some interesting things about like some of the thoughts on parsing and all of that. A little bit about CodeQL, but like the aspect that they're talking about is in terms of like learning CodeQL. It's a lot more fundamental about choices about like designing CodeQL, I guess, and just generally doing um, source code analysis and you know doing all that parsing and stuff. I found it a little bit interesting. So I figured some others here might also. All right. So with that said. Thanks goes out to everyone who tuned in. Um, if you want to catch any past episodes, you can find recent ones on Twitch and all of them on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more links off Anchor. Um, if you want to join our Discord and follow us on Twitter, links for those are down below or in the chat as well. And with that said, we'll see you next week.